Okay, step one is organizing your data, creating your common size financial statements. Step two is we analyze revenue. Revenue drives just about everything else. So when we understand the whys, next thing we need to consider is what's the accounting behind the revenue. So what we're going to take a look at is overview of accounting for revenue, GAAP versus IFRS, and then recognition under ASC 606 is, is a fairly new thing. There is a separate lecture on that that you should have already written. And it does have an impact on companies. So let's start with the basics, uh, general principle of revenue recognition. And generally, what we do in, a, in accrual accounting, revenue recognition can occur independently of cash movements. Okay, so that this becomes an important thing. You can recognize revenue without the cash. And it's the sales of products on credit. We come in with our credit cards. Some kind of companies extend credit to other companies. Um, oftentimes, though, on the opposite side, we have receipt of cash in advance of providing goods and services. So in that case, you would defer the revenue. So if you think of the first one is that you sell a product on credit, so you're going to debit cash and credit, your entry would be debit accounts receivable, credit revenue. Now, when we get cash in advance of providing goods and services, what we would do it would be debit cash, credit deferred revenue. Now, in the case of airlines, it's called air traffic liability because you build, you, when you buy a plane ticket, you pay prior to flying. So those are the two things that can happen. And the fundamental principle that we follow, and this should be inbred in what you, you do now, is revenue should be recognized in the period in which it's earned. This is the matching principle. In US GAAP, it's recognized when it is realized or realizable and earned. The US, uh, the, the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, provides specific guidance on how to apply the principles. So under SEC rules, uh, when to recognize, it's, there is just judgment involved, there's no doubt, but there's four criteria. There's an arrangement between buyer and seller, the product has been delivered, or the service provided, the price is determinable, determined or determinable, and the seller is reasonably sure of collecting money. Now, why do you think that the SEC needed to have some very specific guidance? Right, because companies weren't following the rules. They were reporting revenue, hence generating profits, making the company look better than it was really doing, and it misled the public. So that's why we, we do each one of them uh, to make sure it's a test. Um, under IFRS, um, it's a little bit different, okay? that the entity has transferred ownership, and ownership being defined as the risk and rewards of the ownership of the goods. And the entity retains no involvement or at all or effective control over the goods sold. Uh, that the amount of revenue can be measured reliably, it is probable that the economic benefits will flow to the end to the entity and last the cost associated with the transaction can be measured reliably so that's where there's a little bit of a, a difference that goes in so under IFRS we tend to recognize income um, a little later than you might under US gap. Now, 
that's the basic rules under GAP and IFRS. Now, there's some specifics that you've already seen in ASC 606, uh, which is a, a more current relevant discussion than some of this stuff we're going to talk about now. Under long-term contracts, uh, those that go multiple, spread multiple accounting periods, there's a couple of ways you can account for them. The preferred method under both GAP and IFRS is the percentage of completion. And this is used with projects that are large and go over a multiple year period. And that is used when you can reliably measure the percent of the project complete. It doesn't just mean that cash has been received or cash spent. It's looking at the project itself and saying how much is physically completed. And then you report that percentage of income revenue, percentage of the contract, in its income statement. And then contract costs for the period are expensed against revenue. So net income is reported each year as work is performed. Okay. So there again, we're still at this matching concept. Uh, when the outcome of a contract can't be measured reliable, there's alternative. Okay, under IFRS, if you believe that you're going to be <sighs> under IFRS, if it's probable that costs will be recovered, you can recognize revenue up to the amount of cost incurred. U.S. GAAP allows completed contract method, and completed contract method is where you defer all revenue and cost until the end of the period, uh, but IFRS does not do it. And a company, in this case, can't report any income until the contract is substantially finished. Um, so you think about that, it, it, it may be a little harder to evaluate a company that may have a contract that does span multiple years if they use this method, uh, but that's because they can't be reliably measured. Um, it's all right if a company has primarily short-term contracts, that the contracts run, say, three months, and most everything is done in that three months, and that becomes a consistency issue. Um, next topic is installment sales, and oftentimes, um, People sell something and payments are made over an extended period. Um, so this is an ex installment sale. It essentially is a sale in accounts receivable, okay, a loan, so to speak. Um, and IFRS says you need to s separate the installments into the sales price, the present value of the installment payments, because you're taking an interest component uh, when you do that. Revenue attributable to the sales price is recognized at the date of sale. The interest component is recognized over time. Okay, and that becomes an important uh, thing. A lot of times when you uh, buy a car, and this is buy not lease, uh, at least the same thing, is that in some sense, they're very different transactions. But let's just take a loan on a car is if you go to a dealer, the dealer will um, take your credit app and share it with a number of people. He'll get a minimum price interest rate he needs to charge and he marks it up. Okay, so you may he'll, he, you may go into an auto dealer and he says, how much you want to pay? And you'll say $300 and lo and behold, you'll walk out with $300 monthly payments. Now. If the minimum the bank sent was $275 a month, they can recognize the present value at the date of sale, but the excess amount is an interest component which is recognized over time. Oftentimes, local laws regarding sales may be there. Uh, in the, the sale of real estate under US GAAP, um, use normal revenue, but again, as long as the seller has completed the significant activities, okay? Um, it's assured of the collecting of the sales price. 
or able to estimate the amounts that will not be collected. Um, the sale of real estate under US GAAP, um, if you're using the installment method, um, you can recognize a percentage of the profit as you go along, okay? Um, and the cost recovery method is when the seller doesn't report any profit until the cash amounts paid by the buyer um, are greater than the costs of the sale of the property. Sometimes there's a question of who really is the seller? How much revenue should you recognize or what component of revenue you should recognize? And today, when we purchase so much online, we'll often buy through Amazon, Etsy, or other online platforms. So this becomes a question uh, as to do you report inventory or do you report sales on a gross basis, meaning you record the full amount of the proceeds received from the customer and then deduct the cost of the product, which may be from an independent retailer or provider, and would recognize the, the net amount, your fee, in other words. So the question comes down to who holds the inventory and who is really selling, okay? So do they hold the product in inventory and sell it to you, or do they simply arrange for the supplier to ship the products directly to the end customer? So that is the question with some of these. Um, should they record revenues of the gross amount of sales, less proceeds received from their customers, or should it be the net difference between sales proceeds and their cost? And this is where you're trying to understand the company and what they are doing. Are they simply a provider of technology, or are they selling product? I think when we look at platforms like eBay, um, it would seem to me that that is, uh, they're doing that purely as a service, okay? That's, they're, they're providing the platform and the technology to do that. Amazon, on the other hand, probably does a little bit of, of both. But if we're trying to understand how companies make money, uh, understanding whether they're using gross or net becomes important. Uh, the US GAAP guidance is that you, uh, Revenue is reported gross if the company is the primary obligor under the contract, bears the inventory risk and credit risk, can choose its supplier, and has reasonable latitude to establish price. Now, this is where you get into uh, this is the bear the inventory risk is often problematic. Otherwise, you report revenues net. So that's a current issue that we have with a number of platforms. And this just gives you a brief example on that. Um, it could be somebody who sells airline tickets, concert tickets too, um, Travelocity. Um, if they have revenue, gross is a revenue of 100, cost of goods sold, profit of 10, or just 10. So some of this comes back when we look at the strength of the company. We're going to look at what metrics around revenue or okay